Um, right, so we are now recording. So welcome everyone um, to our weekly call. I trust you've had a fantastic weekend. Um, or indeed, uh, like at least one person on the call, you're enjoying your holiday, um, which is impressive commitment to the uh, DNS calls to uh, um, holiday whilst learning about zero trust and DNS. Let me just share my screen. Um, right, so in terms of agenda, uh, we have um, two things on the agenda. So we have a, 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 a surprise bonus item. Uh, so before we sort of go uh, into Zero Trust DNS, um, um, there were some changes to the plans for the OARC 43 meeting, which you may recall we discussed a few weeks back and was uh, slated to run with the uh, ICANN DNS Symposium um, in South America, potentially Santa Marta in Colombia. But uh, there were some announcements uh, late Friday UK time from the OARC team. Um, and Phil, the uh, new president, you may recall, um, has kindly agreed to uh, come on to uh, just give an update. Uh, so we'll have a couple of bits of that and then we'll go into Zero Trust um, DNS. So let me stop sharing um, and say, uh, Phil, uh, the, the, the floor is yours. Right. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, well, hi, everyone. This is always great to be on this call. It's uh, not often enough. I can't say this is my holiday, but I certainly enjoy following the summaries every week. So it's a great opportunity to be here and uh, give you a little bit of an update <clears throat> on the upcoming ORC events. And uh, it's not a mistake. There's an S there. And uh, more often than not, I mean, some of you might remember from previous uh, ORCs, pre-pandemic, we used to run three workshops a year. Uh, but at that point, uh, it, it was kind of uh, running our staff into the ground and, and we say the pandemic wasn't welcome for anyone, but it allowed us to calibrate to two good conferences a year. And what we started to uh, do was to uh, look at having some community days and smaller engagements also because we haven't been in Europe for a while. Now, uh, to keep it short and uh, with the agenda and not uh, hold you further than necessary from uh, Zero Trust DNS, which I look forward to hear about. So let me tell you what uh, the changes are. Originally, we were planning to go to, as it's now been uh, de-embargoed, Santa Marta in Colombia, part of the LAC DNS week, uh, together with ICANN's uh, IDS. And uh, we were looking forward to do two days of uh, OARC event there. And then what happened is, because of various recalibrations and uh, ICANN being themselves asked to co-locate uh, with the uh, IDS, uh, sorry, with the DNS week, they had to shrink their own schedule, and that meant that OARC 43 became a one-day event, which in our world is a sad face. And we were still planning to go there, but realized uh, from talking to our community members that it'd be a bit of a travel stretch, and we didn't want to uh, provide less value than we normally do to our community. And so we've been in talks in the background to see what could we do, where have we not been for a while, and then it turned out that, well, uh, talking to some right people, at the uh, latest meeting in Krakow that uh, wouldn't it be a great idea to come back to Europe, uh, where we'd been at least a year and a half ago, but we, we'd done mostly meetings in North America and we'd had one in Asia last year. So we, uh, we've been working in the background and we decided that OARC 43 would be taking place in the uh, two days uh, immediately preceding uh, RIPE 89 in, uh, in Prague. So this is a bit more accessible for a lot of our uh, European colleagues. And uh, I think a lot of people were relieved not so much that um, they, not that they didn't want to go to, to, to South America, but the idea of going to South America and not having the budget for it or getting the green light for management for a one day travel turned out to be uh, a relief for some people who thought it was uh, much easier to get to Prague. Either way, we're still doing something in Colombia. And this is probably the, the, big, the big bonus for any of you here who may or may not be planning to go to the DNS week and attend the IDS. Uh, ORC staff will be in uh, in person. There'll be at least three of us, and we plan to organize what we now uh, call uh, DNS Community Days. We've done one of these in Bangkok in February, and we're still looking for some ideas on that. And the uh, the, the plan here is to run a uh, a one day uh, mix of roundtable, panel discussions, and maybe a few presentations, but nothing that the program <coughs> committee is going to be. Uh, running totally, so we have a bit of a we have a bit more. The, the staff is more free to do uh, what they think is a good idea without the staff the the PC. Uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, putting down the guidelines all the way. So we have some some leeway here, and if some people have good ideas about what could make an interesting presentation for a community day in Santa Marta, we're all ears. 
And uh, we're also talking to the program committee uh, at IDS to find some common topics. So we'll still be providing something of value and uh, trying to reach out to local participants and uh, presenters to bring some content to the event. That's it. That's probably more than three minutes, but I uh, couldn't keep it shorter. So mm -hmm. two events, one month apart, one in South America, one in Europe. Can't do it better than this. Uh, and then four months after that, we've got to work 44 in Atlanta. So it's going to be a definitely a packed. Uh, you're not going to be bored with DNS in the fall and in, the, in this winter. Thank you for your time. Brilliant. Thanks uh, for, for that, uh, Phil. So uh, what's off the press? Uh, you, you've heard that. And uh, slightly scary, the, the thought of the, uh, the, the OARP team unleashed for a day in uh, South America, free from the constraints of the, of the PC. I think that's quite, quite fun. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that could, could go down as a legendary day, potentially, <laughs> um, which means fantastic news. Uh, uh, as, as Phil said, there's a lot of stuff then going on DNS-wise, uh, therefore, uh, uh, in, in the autumn, because, of course, we've also got the ITF meeting the week after uh, uh, RIPE um, in, in Dublin. So uh, you could have two solid weeks, inclusive of weekends, back-to-back uh, -back of... Uh, uh, of, of sort of standards and DNS and all those good things, um, should you so wish. Um, anyway, I hope that was useful. Um, uh, th thanks, Phil, for coming on to do that at short notice. Um, but right, let's rapidly shift. Uh, uh, so uh, I guess uh, most people probably uh, were keen to learn more about uh, Microsoft's Zero Trust DNS uh, or ZT DNS uh, announcement, which uh, roughly um, a month ago this week, um, there was um, some coverage of the sort of pre-announcements and, and so on. Um, I don't think there's yet been a chance to actually um, have a presentation about it. Uh, uh, I'm aware of, I've seen plenty of write-ups, but no actual uh, discussion. So this is an opportunity to, to hear directly from the uh, team um, to properly understand uh, the uh, initiative. So I think, Tommy, you're going to run through a presentation um, and your slides are indeed working. So I'll hand over to you and then I don't know if any of your colleagues are going to chip in as well. But uh, so great to have you on the call and uh, really excited to uh, hear about the initiative. So over to you. <laughs> not getting any sound at the moment tommy i don't know if it's my end no it's me i uh not used to zoom and couldn't find the unmute button <laughs> that's definitely working now though uh you'll be pleased to know thank goodness all right thanks for having me um clearly today we're going to be talking about ztdns which you may have heard about by now ZT. oh my god <laughs> Are you, uh, if you're not sick of the ZT acronym yet, but hey, I'm not here to talk about Copilot. So at least you're not getting the full run of Microsoft buzzwords. All right, so what is it? Zero Trust DNS is something we're building into Windows 11 specifically that enables lockdown by domain name. It's something that can be configured locally, but is designed to be configured over MDM, which means Intune or a third-party uh, configuration manager with a, set of, with a set of encrypted DNS servers that are trusted by the administrator to only resolve permitted names. A common term for this would be protective DNS service, something that both the US and UK governments employ as well as some enterprises today. When enabled, Windows 11 will block any traffic that is not approved. And that's where the ZT part of it comes in, is it doesn't take a allow then block approach, it takes a block then allow. So this is a pretty drastic feature that's not for everyone and pretty heavy handed. So why are we building it? Um, in 2021, the US issued an executive order that effectively said, current cybersecurity bad, do things. And by itself, that didn't give us a lot of functional guidance. But a follow-up memo in January 2022, called M2209, very imaginatively, describes a number of technologies requirements in light of doing zero trust security that included DNS, HTTP, and email. 
the portions we care about here involve the DNS. Um, started with it all needs to be encrypted. Great, that's straightforward. Windows 11 already supports using DNS over HTTPS, DNS over TLS. However, it went a little further than that. It said that they need to be able to segment by a domain name. They need to be able to have comprehensive logs that indicate what names were accessed. And they need to be able to accomplish this outside of using a TLS terminating gateway. The accumulation of those requirements is pretty interesting and a catch-22 with what existed previously. Because with apps doing their own encrypted DNS, with malware doing its own encrypted DNS at the application layer, we can't log what they're doing. Any policy that's applied to the system DNS client doesn't apply to them. And that means that we'll still be logging lots of destination IP addresses with no idea of what name they're associated with. And the only way to accomplish that prior to ZTDNS or something like it um, would be to have TLS termination so that you can break in and see what exactly is the traffic doing. So we're gonna do a step-by-step walkthrough because the basic idea is straightforward. The edge cases are absolutely not. So to start with, ZTTNS is configured not just with servers, but some other things as well. Um, we'll talk about reasons later, but there are not everything uses domain names. And so in addition, there is a configuration that will list out the IP subnets that are to be allowed. And then they are named groups such that there's a name still associated in the logging when those are communicated with. There's a list of client certificates, which allows the client to present an identity to the server such that the server can apply per client policy without having to guess as to who the client is based on things like source IP address, which seems to be the common way to apply client policy today. Something that doesn't work super well when you have roaming clients. And then as well, a list of expected server certs, which allows you to effectively pin a chain such that your protective DNS service can't just be signed by anything that could be found in the device's root store, but has to chain up through something that was expected by the same configuration channel that turned on ZTDNS client in the first place. Once that configuration has occurred, Windows 11 will start blocking all outbound IPv4, IPv6 traffic, and then start poking allow exceptions, starting with DHCP, DHCPv6, and neighbor discovery, because without those, we're not going to be able to find the gateway we need to send traffic to in the first place. Note that that doesn't mean that we listen to all of the data that come back. Um, Normally, we defer to the DNS servers advertised here in the absence of administrator or user configuration that specifies a DNS preference. But in this case, we will completely ignore advertised DNS servers because we've already been configured with protective servers to use at all times. Then we also create manual exceptions for the P DNS servers themselves for obvious reasons. However, Note that the configuration for these servers requires that you provide both the name, whether it's the dot host name or the doe template alongside an IP address to use. This is to avoid the chicken and egg problem where if there's only a name configured or a template configured, we still have to resolve that name first. And again, we're taking the Z pretty seriously and we want to minimize trust in anything that would have an opportunity to misdirect us. Once that's established, this is what the happy path looks like. The client, any app on the client can use the DNS APIs as they exist today. There are zero changes needed for applications that call the DNS API asking for domain names. Under the hood, the DNS client is going to ask the PDNS server, which 
outside of the client's view, can do policy checks. It checks the list of allowed domain names. It may pivot that against the allowed clients, which it's getting an identity from the client certificate presented by ZTDNS. And if it wants to resolve the name, it sends back the A, quad A, service binding, what have you, records. And any IP addresses within will trigger ZTDNS to make allow outbound exceptions for those IP addresses. Then and only then the resolution is returned to the application such that we can avoid race conditions where an application acquires a resolution, but ZTDNS isn't prepared to allow the outbound traffic. And then the app, oblivious to any of this happening, says, cool, resolution, open a connection to web server, and it works. Everything else does not. So this includes cases such as applications who want to connect to their own encrypted DNS servers. Um, if they try to do so via a hard-coded IP address, that's not going to work because we will not have created an allow outbound exception. If they want to do so by domain name, it's possible that they can get their connection set up. For example, if the encrypted DNS server, for whatever reason, chooses to resolve a name of a server that provides DO or DOT services, then the IP address will end up allowed and the application can set up a connection and it can issue DNS queries and it can get valid DNS resolutions. But those resolutions are useless unless they are repeated through the ZTDNS client because the IP addresses that were resolved within its connection will not trigger allow outbound exceptions to be created. Thus, we are tackling the problem not by trying to get access to the traffic, but rendering the traffic useless, such that our DNS logs represent the truth about domain names that are being used. More or less, edge cases to be discussed later. Um, applications attempting to connect to named servers or named peers that will not be resolved by the PDNS server, also blocked, and local network IP addresses where the server may not even know those names um, or just trying to discover them manually, doing multicast discovery of services. None of that will work by design. The idea being, again, that this feature is a heavy lockdown one that is not necessarily intended for everyone and is absolutely not on by default, if nothing else, because it needs heavy configuration that is environment dependent. So what does this actually give us? Um, I think everyone on this call probably understands this already from everything I've just said, but just calling out some illustrations of the customers, specifically the US government asking why they want this is they can eliminate plain text traffic inspection that would allow inspection by other parties on the same link. It prevents the need to inspect SNI such that they don't need to worry about the deployment of encrypted client hello, because the all the cases where the SNI is telling the truth, ZTDNS will also have visibility into what was being resolved. Again, um, cases like domain name fronting, where a server accepts connections for one name and then accepts within requests against a different host are not tackled by either solution. It eliminates the need for doing TLS termination when the scope of doing so is determining domain name destinations. It's still something enterprises who wish to inspect data flows will need to do or otherwise handle but specifically for name management, it is not required. It means you no longer have to do an arms race with application space encrypted DNS. You don't need to be doing machine learning to identify the difference between HTTPS and DOE. You don't need to be trying to build up lists of known servers. It no longer matters. Even if you accidentally resolve endpoints or include IP addresses in your allowed subnets that include encrypted DNS servers, their queries are irrelevant.
So this is a two minute demo that our dev lead put together um, to illustrate in the context of a phishing email, why the zero trust approach where we block by default without knowing what all needs to be blocked is important. Let me know if the audio doesn't work, otherwise I'll assume it is. The audio is not working. Okay. Um... I think you have to share your, uh, your your machine audio separately to having your microphone switched on. So I don't see share, oh wait. I don't see share options to that effect. Uh, share computer sound, never mind. That's the one. Awesome. All right. Take two. It's still not working, unfortunately. That's hilarious because I can't hear it either. <laughs> um, all right, let's try one more time. Otherwise, I will narrate it. Um, yeah, you'll need to turn the sound on on your machine, Tommy. Well, it was the first time. It was only the second time. And I just assumed that maybe you were stealing it, but no such luck. All right, one more time. Still quiet. All right, that's okay. Let me narrate. So this is a phishing email. Um, that is not from Microsoft, although it looks pretty convincing. Someone just copied it. When you click on that link, we go to some other site that's not owned by Microsoft, but check out that login page. Looks legit. If you put credentials in there, it'll get harvested by somebody. Note now that there's also a direct by IP address. We've observed both examples in real phishing campaigns against us, such that Maybe you respond by domain name, but maybe you avoid suspicious names by hard coding an IP address to contact. So that's what that looks like by default. But when you have ZTDNS enabled, because the administrator isn't specifically allowing this domain name, which in this case is a pretty obvious looking word-based one, <laughs> but in practice, these are usually very convoluted domain names in spaces that can be rapidly issued and changed. And then the same being true for IP addresses. Again, if it wasn't manually allowed ahead of time, this isn't going to work. But on the same machine, note the reaction times in going to websites. Even though there's chains of domain name resolutions that are occurring where the root page has to look up other names, it's still not visible to the user. Now an administrator can come into the logs and see what was blocked so that, that a behavior can be audited after the fact. So a phishing campaign occurred and we found the suspicious endpoint definitions, who all hit them? Now you can know through log aggregation. And the allowed log or the permitted log, you can trace applications behavior. This process resolved this name and we allowed it because it was resolved. In the case of IP addresses, it will happen because of a IP subnet exception and it will list the name of that exception. So deployment is clearly going to be tricky and this is not something that you can simply flip on and have work smoothly. The ZTDNS client supports an audit mode setting that will do a what if behavior that says, we're gonna do all our permitted and blocked logging and we will set up connectivity to the PDNS service and use it for resolution such that you can mimic your policy. But when we would have blocked things, we'll simply log it and then not touch the traffic. That way you could have a ring of users testing out ZTDNS and give you visibility into what would happen and react accordingly as you prepare your system to be more accurate to your real world dependencies. So to illustrate this, this is an example, high level flow of how one might start deploying. Um, 
as a first step is step zero, even before you do anything ZTDNS related, it behooves you to check that encrypted DNS even works in the first place. Um, do you have unexpected firewalls that are gonna mess with it? Is your server misconfigured? Is the certificate not being trusted by the client? These would all be wonderful things to figure out before you start using that connection to lock things down. Because once you have ZTDNS enabled, if you cannot reach the trusted server, we don't do IP networking because that's the expected security trade-off for customers that need this. Once that is established as working, you can, use ZTDNS in audit mode manually on machines that you have access to the keyboard for to do things like verify that the other configuration works as expected. Are you able to validate your server when you are sending out a pinned cert and not just expecting it to work against public PKI signing? Um, is the client actually running as expected? Are the logs actually showing up? Um, are you able to aggregate them? Once you can test that out in a lab, you can start rolling out ZTDNS in audit mode to a wider spread of users because different users, different departments are gonna have different dependencies than your IT office, right? There's applications that are unique to your finance department, to the HR department um, that you will not have thought about potentially. Um, there may be people using homegrown software or something developed by somebody who quit 10 years ago and no one's touched it since because it's written in COBOL. These things happen um, that you can start uncovering these where Automod says, hey, I would have blocked this. Hey, here's a process you forgot is included in your gold standard image. Um, verifying this, that in fact, remote management does push out the settings as expected and that you are able to get those logs into aggregated systems. This results in a, in a loop where then you refine your policy. As you observe things and realize what your real world dependencies on are, you start building up your allow lists. Um, and if you want to start by doing block lists instead where your resolvers are generally permissive, that's a place to start as well. Um, in doing a a real understanding, you can build up both allow and block lists and then have the unknown be a third category that is something you want to reduce. Um, for general web, web browsing environments, that's clearly going to be a very large list and maybe you start in a fashion that says, we'll generally allow, but continue to log as suspicious unknown names. If you're doing a true lockdown, then unknown is something you want to burn down to zero. But figure out of these unknowns, was it something we're actually okay with? Is it something expected? Whether it's by IP address or by domain name. So you find out that you allowed all the domain names for the office suite, but it turns out that even though you can use Teams chat, you get blocked when you try to call somebody. Um, turns out that that's using media protocols that do not discover domain names through the DNS. Um, or more accurately, do not discover the IP addresses they'll communicate with peers with by using domain names. Um, and it turns out your friendly neighborhood Redmond vendor will tell you what the required IP subnets are, as does Zoom, as does WebEx, and other applications that require direct subnet access for the purpose of firewalls anyway. And that's a list that you will want to build up. On the machine that I'm connected to this call with, I have between 50 and 100 IP subnets configured that allow all of the applications that I use in my real world job to function correctly, a configuration that I've been running for some time with zero stability issues. Finally, as you build confidence that your logs show that um, the things that are blocked are things you didn't want truly and you believe that your workers will be able to function normally, this is where you do the cautious rollout of turning off audit mode and doing full enforcement. And again, in a loop, tracking what does break anyway, because there will be some things, and identifying if there's something that you need to fix, or if that's something that, yes, in fact, your user may want it, but you do not. 
Um, and this is something where you want to reduce the security team's responses needed. In true zero trust fashion, there is no final state. You will consistently and always be using this as one of many tools in your security deployment where you constantly reanalyze the situation. You deploy new software or you actually end a vendor relationship and those allows don't need to be present anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, and I just want to get ahead of this question right away, um, the insider builds do not have ZTDNS enabled such that you can use it because it is still in development. There are still some things I'm describing here that do not work. And the last thing we want are tons of bug reports for things we already know that we are working on. Um, as a result, our staff is working with customers directly and we are absolutely queued up as it is. Um, and so with apologies, we are not accepting private preview applicants. Um, so why did we bother telling the world and teasing this out? Because this is, this is a huge shift and it's something that other vendors need to be aware of and collaborating on, right? Because the good news is, is that on the wire, there's no special protocol usage. You're using RFC defined encrypted DNS and you are potentially using MTLS to authenticate your clients. That's it. Everything else that's specific to ZTDNS occurs on the endpoint or are on the client for enforcement or on the server for policy decision-making. Um, but we wanna make sure that vendors that are doing name interception realize that there are other approaches that they can take um, whether it's deploying and providing protective DNS servers that may not be the true endpoint, but allow them to get in the middle of queries and apply policy, that that's the approach they want to take as opposed to doing port 53 inspection in that port 53 will not be used when ZTDNS is active. So I promise you some discussion about the fact that indeed we're not chugging Kool-Aid. This is not a silver bullet. There are things that administrators will need to be aware of that they will have to change about how they do today, or especially in our first version, understand that there are limitations. So for example, this is intended for managed enterprise environments. Um, this is not intended for consumer use. It's not intended for when a remote administrator is a different entity than the device administrator. Um, like most operating system side features, this is not intended to get into fights with the local administrator. A local administrator can simply turn it off or change its configuration. This is intended for zero trust environments where employees themselves are seen as threats for exfiltration of data, um, where network paths are seen as hostile because no one knows who's on the path, when your services are always validated because you should assume that any node in your architecture could be controlled if you're a government by another government or an enterprise by another government or a competitor through supply chain attacks or existing networking infrastructure attacks, doesn't matter. Um, you wanna limit the blast radius of the attack um, for home consumer environments, this is not it. It cannot give name visibility when the administrator allows other networking tunneling features to exist. So for example, if you have a VPN tunnel installed, um, it can inject packets below this enforcement layer. And usually by design, right, you want the VPN to operate as low as possible and block any other traffic. Um, ZTDNS is primarily designed for not having control of a network edge. You have a work from home employee, your services are available over the public internet and enforced access using authentication, which is recommended zero trust practice, both by Microsoft's guidance, um, by the US government architecture for zero trust, NSA security guidance, et cetera. That said, if you are using a VPN, if it is tightly scoped using say, name-based rules on Windows that are configured into our DNS client, 
that will work just fine. Um, there is still the caveat that ZTDNS's logs will see traffic that goes over the tunnel as associated with the domain name of the VPN gateway. And so further name auditing will need to occur within the VPN endpoints gateway or client. When you trust a domain name, you are trusting the holder of the private key of that domain name or a server capable of opening ports on a system that possesses that private key. I.e., when you trust a name, you are trusting the operator of that name. So if you trust a name that provides domain fronting, then that's something you need to take into account. If connections are being made to foo.example, but the foo.example server accepts requests for bar.example, that's violated trust in you or in the domain name, but that's not something ZTDNS can help you remedy. It treats all networks as equally untrusted, very much by design. Because again, the target scenario here is the wandering client um, or the work from home client. And so coming into the work office changes nothing. The local network is still untrusted. That's a scenario that along with captive portals that we are exploring because we believe there will be a need for that. But we're starting from the secure fail if we don't like it end of the spectrum and moving our way toward the middle as we find secure ways of doing it. Because um, again, there are plenty of mechanisms you can use to fail open today, but a subset of our customers really want to have hard fails if their expectations are not being met. Captive portals today usually rely on intercepting plain text DNS queries and redirecting browsers to a captive portal page, um, sometimes hosted on the local router itself, which means that doing normal certificate validation is not going to work. As a result, ZTDNS will not allow it. It will see that as an attack. We know that this is a gap for, especially for the traveling employee, as opposed to working from home, where I would sincerely hope you do not have a captive portal in place. Um, but clients on the move are going to run into this problem when you cannot do network registration in advance when you're not doing MAC address registration. Um, we are aware of that gap. So in summary, so that we can get to the pretty long chat queue I see building in the red bubble, um, ZTDNS makes domain names the primary identifier. Um, rather than trying to infer domain names and doing IP-based logic primarily, ZTDNS does domain names primarily and allows shortcuts for doing IP exceptions. This is a useful tool for the heavy-minded, for the seriously concerned. It is not for everyone, nor is it even for the average enterprise potentially. Um, this is something that requires heavy management of your name infrastructure before this can be deployed. Um, so we are targeting governments clearly, as you recall, the original requirements of this feature resulted from a U.S. cybersecurity order. Um, that said, we have had interest expressed by other compliance-minded customers that, frankly, i have pretty diverse. Um, so we're looking forward to partnering with them. So at this point, Andrew, I don't know if you want me to cruise through the chat or if you want to MC the the queue for me. Uh, let's. Well, well, firstly, thank you, Tommy. That was uh, fantastic. Um, uh, let's uh, tr try and do what we can uh, uh, in the available time. Uh, uh, we we've only got. I think we got about ten minutes. Um, I, I'm conscious that. A lot of the comments in the chat, I think, are comments rather than questions. So I'll scroll through them. And uh, uh, equally, if anyone wants to ask a question ver verbally, as I put in the chat, uh, press the reactions icon to raise your, your virtual hand. I'll, I'll scroll through firstly the chat uh, at pace. So apologies in advance if I miss something. Um, and, and then I'll come to any, any raised hands in the order that they're raised. Um, 
I like the idea of MDM as man in the middle service. I think that's uh, very good. Um, there's some skepticism in the chat about whether this will break typical applications, but I think you covered that in, in what you then went on to say, uh, Tommy. So I think we can skip over that. Um, uh, oh, okay. First, uh, first clear question, I think. Uh, is, uh, is this uh, zero trust DNS encryption based on an RFC? Yes, and so you can you you can configure either servers by using DNS over HTTPS configuration or by using DNS over TLS configuration. Either will work, um, and those are the the two supported options, both of which are defined RFC eight four eight four and RFC seven eight five eight, although later updated. Um, the only other network behavior may be if you are using uh, client authentication then you'll be using MTLS, whose RFC number I do not remember. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, how long does the firewall rule to the site IP exist? So uh, this was something that you would think or potentially expect could be TTL related, but we very quickly found out that is not practical, um, nor is it really, uh, necessary in most cases. So we have a configurable timeout that the administrator can set to say when you resolve names and allow them do so for X seconds. Um, when connections are approved, it's at the connection layer, not at the packet layer. And that's part of what makes it fast. It also means that once an, a connection is established, it won't be broken. Um, when the approvals time out. Approval windows apply to the establishment of new connections. UDP doesn't always have connections setting aside quick. Um, the platform already has a concept of estimating flow, um, where new flow starts after a, a lack of activity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, what would happen in a... In, in, in case a, a user uses a legit DO server, such as Firefox to Cloudflare? No configuration outside of the system is trusted. And so you have two options. Um, you can use the policy that all major browsers provide to configure them to say, look, you're in a different environment here. You shouldn't be using encrypted DNS, um, defer to the system, or um, you can see what happens. And I'll warn you, um, Firefox is actually pretty well behaved. It will attempt. And when it realizes that it can't do anything by default, it will fall back to the system um, and just work. It can be configured to not do that um, by a non-administrator. And if that happens, they're blocked. And it's not an expression of judgment by the system against Firefox or Mozilla. It's simply that everyone's untrusted, right? Yeah. Everyone needs to come through the system. Yeah, which I think is a fair explanation of zero trust. Uh, I love the comment from Vicky that this should help with the current dip of employment opportunities for tech workers. Um, I'm not sure that's a question, but uh, yeah, that's an <laughs> interesting observation. <laughs> so uh, th thanks to Microsoft for doing its thing to uh, uh, raise employment options. Uh, um, perhaps more seriously, will, will it be possible to use this without encrypted DNS? So could you use a PDNS service provided via DOE 53? with this rather than DO or DOT? And the answer is no. We don't have any assurance that the server is who it claims to be. And recall again that I understand that for some enterprises, there's a inherent trust in their network link on certain links. And they say that we are hosting our port 53 resolver within a bubble that we trust. ZTDNS has no such concept. All network paths are assumed hostile. Um, and so again, it's not that we're trying to generalize this feature for all cases. We're specifically focusing on the zero trust subset. And so no, there will be no support for plain text DNS as a PDNS approved endpoint. Yeah. Um, some devices and protocols rely on MDNS. Does uh, ZTE DNS take into account um, MDNS? It does not. And that's because MDNS for all intents and purposes is crowdsource name resolution. 
right? There is no source of authority on MDNS. You have endpoints on the network responding to broad questions. That is not seen as a trustworthy source of information. And so, because you can't pre-approve authoritative endpoints for MDNS, right? So no, anything that relies on MDNS is broken until you uh, make network subnet exceptions. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. This is an interesting one from uh, Jim. Um, how will this work if and when uh, ECH becomes the norm and 30% of the internet goes through a single Cloudflare domain set of or set of IPs? So this is a good question. Um, part of this uh, is that in another aspect of my day job, I am supporting the migration to IPv6 by building support for 464XLAT CLAT component into Windows for generalized network interfaces, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, what have you. Um, this is something that IPv6 deployment can help with by eliminating or reducing the co-hosted names within uh, behind IP addresses, right? Mm. When you don't have NATs or accumulation like that, this is less of a concern. That said, that's obviously not in the control of the enterprise by other parties. The target audience here generally isn't doing as much trust in these kinds of endpoints because they want to know the entities in advance. Um, that said, as I noted earlier, trust in a domain name is trust in its co-hosting environment. And so that's not something that ZTDNS is going to help you with. It's something that enterprises should carefully consider when they are taking dependencies on software. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Okay, um, Chris Box has put a link to um, a, a useful document of deployment considerations uh, document for this, which I'll, I'll reshare afterwards as well to give people a chance to read that. Right, there's some more questions in the chat, but um, let's give a chance to uh, Peter and then Tom, both of whom we've been wait waiting patiently, and then we'll see how we're getting on time-wise. So Peter, first, over to you. Thanks. Uh, Tommy, brilliant presentation, really interesting. Thank you very much for your time. Um, so I was curious when um, the uh, initial resolution is done, um, is it is the resolved IP address or the answer sent back to the client and then just blocked from the client, or is it is it sort of uh, I don't know some other kind of response from the objective DNS server? So it's it's just normal DNS protocol, other than it has to use encrypted DNS. Um, the DNS server doesn't change its DNS wire behavior. It sends back any record that contains a resolved IP address. I don't remember them all off the top of my head, but you know, A quad A service binding and others um, will result any one of them that says, ah, here are IP addresses. We treat those as approved. We expect that the server will have sent back an NX domain or a refused. Otherwise, any IP address we get back will create an allow outbound exception for it. There's no concept of creating block rules on the client because we block everything by default. We only have a concept of allow rules. Right, sorry. Um, Did that uh, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I, I'm not sure I got your question. Um, I'm, so, I'm trying to figure out, I'm putting it in my head, I'm exam imagining a, a t some sort of tunneling example uh, situation where it's tunnel over DNS and the outbound. So it seems like exfiltration might be able to happen because um, the outbound DNS request is going to happen by the protective DNS server. And I was wondering if the mm. answer is getting sent to the um, to the client. And if it is, then inbound uh, tunneling would be uh, enabled. It, I don't think you're trying to solve this problem, but I was just curious if that's um, possible. Oh, that's a, right. That's a great question. Uh, no, ZTDNS is not attempting to target DNS, uh, DNS exfiltration. However, um, it should be noted that DNS exfiltration usually has... In order to do that exfiltration, you've got to have a large set of names under some controlled zone by the attacker that you can use. Um, when your logs are fully authoritative, this ought to be easier to find. Yeah. Um, and why are you approving that that zone in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. The protective DNS server should be doing its job. But um, I was just curious. Um, but the question was more about is if the answer is sent back to the client. Um, it, right. And it always is. Nothing changes yeah. in the behavior there um, because okay. there's no side channel to communicate that. OK, cool. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter. Tom. Hi. Um, so 
the folks I generally deal with, which are, are schools and other education environments, um, don't have uh, Vicky's uh, op option of hiring loads mm -hmm. of expensive IT folks um, and generally sort of fairly understaffed. Um, it seems to me that this could be a useful tool in their arsenal um, of uh, ensuring students don't bypass safeguarding protections, um, but that it would only probably be feasible if the majority of, you know, if, if it wasn't a, a sort of default deny um, on, on domains. Do you think I am barking up a gum tree thinking this could be useful in that environment? Are there any major problems you can see? Um, should we not pursue it and ignore it completely? No, I don't think you're barking up a tree here. Um, education environments are a prime example of an environment where you do kind of want to take a block by default, even before ZTDNS, right? Like I remember in middle school that uh, we ended up having to ask for websites to be allowed rather than them trying to hunt down the different proxies we could use to get to pop games and I could play insane <laughs> aquarium. Um, don't know if anyone remembers flash game era. So, um, so to that end though, as you say, unlike a security minded large enterprise, they're not equipping multiple staff members who are focused on the one protocol, um, the one operation. This is something where, again, we came to the public early, despite the fact that we don't have a preview available to the public to prep vendors, because this is a prime opportunity for a vendor who provides name security to provide an out-of-box solution where they don't need to manage it. They provide allow lists and the vendor provides a server endpoint. And then the, the school can just deploy that endpoint and trust that the vendor is applying their policy for them, right? It's a good market opportunity. And once the server management is provided for a school, I think that that's something they ought to really be excited about. And that's exactly the track I was just thinking as you were presenting that, that we would probably head down as a provider um, to schools. You know, the challenge just is that students use so many different domain names and keeping on top of that, can you allow, can you allow, can you allow, is like will probably receive a lot of pushback. Um, is, is, if you do do the kind of, like, hey, we definitely allow this, and and we and we log the gray areas. Is there any? Is there a, is there a made? Obviously, we missed that default deny action. But is there anything else major that I'm missing there as a as a as a problem? So the value in doing uh, in the value in using a PDNS server that's generally permissive is reduced, of course, right? Because it's going to resolve most names, and those names, if they support tunneling, means you're going to exfiltrate data. Um, what you still have is the logging that says you connected to that one in the first place. So if you later find that a tunnel is suspicious, you won't have visibility into the names it contacted, but you will know who used it. Yeah. Um, that said, a big benefit that is present, no matter the behavior of the server, is that you eliminate the use of app space DNS. No matter what else there they end up doing tunneling wise, they can't use their own queries and responses. They have to repeat those through your logged gateway. And just, just to, um, to sort of tack on to, to that, what would what we would find useful. Um, so in a controlled browser environment, say Microsoft Edge with an extension, we can do a lot more inspection than we can in just like the regular, all the other stuff that goes on in a box. Um, differentiating between apps therefore and saying this is this gets a different dns treatment to do would be highly useful in, in our in our in our environments you're talking about different applications within the client operating system having different yeah that's interesting i it's something that's outside the scope of ztdns but i know that other features attempt to target which is why i want to highlight the ztdns is not the only tool, right? It's not something you're gonna turn on and everything lockdown works. Um, it should be used in tandem with other solutions that let you apply the layers of security and the dimensionality. Whereas ETDNS says for the machine, here are endpoints that are allowed to be communicated with using identifiers that are actually useful. 
in that most places can't just give you their IP lists in advance. But after that, um, it makes perfect sense to apply other things. For example, firewall rules in generally are, are generally are still very applicable, right? If you want to block certain ports, ZTDNS may trust the endpoint, the firewall may not trust the port, they add up together such that you keep blocking down to the subset you actually like. Sorry, Tom. Uh, sounds <laughs> like there's scope for, dare I say, a, a, a new smooth wall uh, product, uh, Tom, that uh, sort of folds this into something else. So still employment opportunities uh, around this, which is good news. I Let's think. hope so. Eh? <laughs> right, look, uh, I'm conscious of the time. Let's, uh, uh, Tommy, would you be up for if I if I go through and pull out uh, any outstanding questions? Could we maybe run through those offline? Would that be okay? That'd be perfectly fine. Perfect. And also, are you happy to share your slides as well? I should have asked you that at the start, but I forgot. Ah, uh, yeah, I'll email those to you after the call. Fantastic. Um, okay, well, that, that, that was brilliant. And apologies for the questions I didn't get through, uh, that, uh, but uh, that, that was incredibly interesting. Um, uh, and I think, uh, uh, yeah, you, you've, you've, I think, cleared up a lot of things, albeit um, is almost even more stuff, uh, questions come, come to mind uh, as a consequence. Um, to, I'm going to very quickly wrap up the call. Um, so if those of you that aren't completely timed out, just if, if you have two or three minutes, that's literally all it will take. Um, and I will skip through a lot of things. Uh, I just wanted to highlight, uh, if you haven't seen it, in terms of uh, from the news headlines, uh, interesting article from Jeff Houston um, on, on, on whether we should call time on DNSSEC. So uh, uh, worth a read if, if you have uh, um, a spare half hour, because as, as always with Jeff, it's uh, very thoughtful and uh, it is not, not short, but, but, but I think def definitely worth a look. Um, and you'll see a link also, the second bullet, I think that's the document that Chris was referring to, deployment considerations for, for the Windows ZT DNS uh, client. So again, I'll share this link again afterwards. Um, and then the third one, and then I'll skip on to other stuff, uh, a really interesting uh, piece from um, SIDN Labs on their DNS for all um, uh, experimental public resolver, um, which uh, if you're in that space, again, worth a look. I will skip over the other news items um, uh, in, in the interest of time. Quick, quick reminder um, that there's a sort of deadline fast approaching um, on a couple of things, but but uh, uh, the, sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. Um, uh, if you're going to ITF 120 in Vancouver and haven't registered yet, if you don't register by 2359 UTC today then you'll miss the super early rate and it bumps up by about, uh, sorry, $200 um, if, to attend in person, about $70, I think, to attend remotely. So if you're planning to attend, it's worth registering today if you can. Um, and also coming up this week, if you are if you had a, a, a birds of a feather proposal in and it needs revision, you've got till the end of this week, 7th of June, to put in the revised um, proposal. Um, th there's sort of various other things coming up but in the interest of time, I won't go through those. You can look through those at your leisure. Um, uh, go back to where we started. Uh, the OARC Community Day in Santa Marta will be 26th September, so the day after the ICANN DNS Symposium. And uh, DNS uh, so OARC 43 will be 26th, 27th October, the weekend before uh, RIPE 89 um, in Prague. Uh, and then finally, next week, um, uh, sort of juggle the agenda slightly. Um, uh, so Ross and Josh, who both of whom are or were on this call, um, and are also the co-authors of a book on DNS insecurity, uh, have kindly agreed to uh, come on the call to just talk about some of the aspects of writing the book uh, and some of the kind of content of it. So, uh, uh, and hopefully we'll be offering signed copies of the book at a very reasonable price from your favorite bookseller uh, as a bonus feature. So um, that, that should be a good thing uh, to, 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 uh, so to just hear some of their experiences fr from that uh, process. You'll see other stuff on there, which again, don't have time to talk about, and there's certainly no time for AOB. Uh, so I'll stop sharing there. Um, I hope 
That was useful. I think it was uh, incredibly useful, to be honest. Uh, so thank you, uh, Tommy, for the presentation. Um, I think he's gone now because he had another commitment, but thank you uh, in your absence, Phil, for giving a hot off the press update as well on the uh, DNS, uh, uh, so, uh, the ARC, sorry, uh, uh, sessions now uh, lined up for, for the autumn. Um, uh, as I said uh, just now, I'll, I'll, I'll go through all the stuff in the chat and uh, share any outstanding questions with Tommy and add those to uh, the, the web page with a link to the recording so you can see the, the full list, with, hopefully with answers um, post-call. So thank you for that. Have a fantastic week, everyone, and uh, look forward to catch up same time next week when we can hear from uh, Ross and uh, Josh as well, hopefully. So see you, see you all then and uh, enjoy the week in the meantime. Bye, everyone.